Welcome. Today is August 11th, Thursday. I'm Jeff Huge, Chief Investment Officer at JWH Investment Partners and founder at Alpha Insights. And this is your Daily Five. Daily Five is usually the show where we uh, talk about the five most important charts for us today. But before we get into that, I just want to tell you all about our free investment newsletter. Uh, we just published our most recent edition, our monthly macro edition, The Big Picture, uh, on the 31st. So it's pretty fresh stuff. Um, it's free to subscribe and it's delivered directly to your email inbox around the first of each month. Uh, the newsletter is affectionately called Huge Insights, The Big Picture. Uh, therein, we discuss really the key macro factors affecting the economy and the markets, along with our current forecast. And we also offer an optional member level for those who want more. It's $10 a month, not a lot. But members receive our weekly Alpha Insights Idea Generator Lab publication. This is an institutional publication that our institutional subscribers have been used to getting. And we now provide this to uh, newsletter members. So uh, it details our top actionable trade idea each week. So, you know, we parse through thousands of charts to come up with uh, an idea that we think is really a fat pitch. So, you know, take a look at it. Uh, you can find us on Twitter or my website at jwhinvestment.com and just go right to the newsletter section and you can subscribe there and look at all the archive copies and the most recent copies. So uh, with that, I would like to kick off with chart number one and talk a little bit about what we think is pretty important to the markets, not just this week, but going forward, and that is inflation. Um, you know, the July CPI and PPI data came out uh, yesterday and today, and it was below expectations. It came in at 8.5% and 9.8% respectively, and that's compared to 9.1% and 11.3% in June. So, you know, it confirms that inflation has probably peaked at the headline level, but core inflation is still rising. And one of the things that's really driving these changes is that the majority of the change in the headline number came from a decline in energy prices. Recall that WTI crude peaked around $130 a barrel in March and is now trading something closer to about $93.5 a barrel. So that big drop in oil prices really had an impact on the headline number, uh, but the core number does not include uh, energy prices. And so, you know, here's the rub, housing, food, and services inflation actually increased in July. And the core inflation uh, data is actually about 40% related to housing. So the chart on the left illustrates the nine different calculations that the Federal Reserve Board uses to measure core inflation. These are various Fed banks around the country. There's nine of them in total. I think a couple of these come from the Cleveland Fed and a couple come from uh, the San Francisco Fed, but all said, you know, in look, looking at these nine measures on average, we see that core inflation has kind of been hovering uh, in this five to six percent range. And it's actually been ticking up the core PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure of core inflation, actually uh, ticked up to 4.8 from 4.7 percent uh, most recently. And the average of these is about 5.73 percent. The problem here is that the Fed's target rate is 2%. And we are meaningfully above that level. And that is going to be a persistent problem because uh, housing is based on implied rent and all of the other activities that go into uh, purchasing and selling homes. And that continues to be elevated. So, um, you know, the problem here is that we're going to have some uh, fairly sticky if not persistent inflation for the months and perhaps even years to come. So with that, let's take a look at chart number two. Um, chart number two looks at the yield curve. And before I explain that, let me just suggest this. You know, there's been a lot of ink spilled over the correct definition of what a recession is. Well, you know, the word recession literally means contraction. And so when we think about GDP growth, nominal GDP growth actually increased by 6.6% the first quarter and by 7.3% in the second quarter, a sequential increase. However, if we adjust those numbers for inflation 
and look at real GDP growth, which is, which is what the Fed looks at and what the NBER looks at to measure the health of the economy, um, real GDP actually declined by 1.6% in the first quarter. And initially, our first cut at what it's going to be in the second quarter looks like it's going to be down about 0.9%, uh, so a little less than 1%. But you know, herein lies the debate, right? Are two consecutive quarterly declines in real GDP indicative of a recession? If we look back in history, um, every recession since 1947 has been preceded by two sequential declines in real economic output. And so, you know, the question here is maybe, maybe, maybe that's the answer to, to that question. But, you know, there's another gauge that we can look at that has a perfect track record. And that is the spread, the yield spread between the 10 year and the two year treasury. Now, an inversion in this yield spread has preceded every US recession over the past 50 years. And that yield curve, which is the lower panel of this chart, the twos minus the 10 years uh, spread is actually inverted by 45 basis points at this point. And so, um, you know, critics will say, well, the Fed really looks at the 10 year minus the three month. Well, that's only 13 basis points positive. So it's pretty close. Uh, and um, I think that the vast majority of the data is based on the, the 10 year minus the two years. So, you know, I would look at that and, and suggest that we need to be prepared for recession. In fact, my old friend Harley Bassman, who's the creator of the Move Index, uh, was quoted recently saying it's a stone cold fact that the best predictor of a recession is the yield curve. And I agree with him 100 percent. Let's look at chart number three to get a sense of what we might expect out of the market going forward. Um, this happens to be a midterm election year. And, you know, midterm election years have a specific cycle or flow to them when we look at the stock market going back to at least 1946. And according to Stock Traders Almanac, which is a pretty good uh, resource for data, during a midterm election year, and especially one that is also the second year in office for a new Democratic president. And that would be the red line or orangish line uh, in this chart. Um, the uh, S&P 500 has actually tended to bottom in late June, but then rally into early August, and then finally decline again to new lows in late October. And this looks at all the data going back to 1946 and being specific to these circumstances that I've alluded to. Now, there's two key dates that I've been targeting uh, for a market low this year, and they are both major cycle turn dates as modeled by the late great cycle analyst Paul McRae Montgomery. Uh, the first of those is October 25th, and that actually would coincide quite well with this uh, midterm election cycle as discussed above here with uh, Stock Traders Almanac. Um, the second is actually November 8th, election day. So these are two very specific cycle dates in Montgomery's work that we have been focusing on as a high probability target low for uh, the S&P 500. So let's keep that in mind going forward when we look at chart number four, which I think is quite germane to today's circumstances. Um, what we're looking at here in chart number four is the VIX and the VVIX. The VIX is the volatility index. That's the top panel of this chart. And the VVIX is the volatility of the volatility index. Now, yesterday, the VIX posted its lowest closing price since the S&P bottomed in June. And so far, we've been experiencing a pretty rare uh, nine consecutive weekly declines in the VIX. You don't really see uh, more than four or five very often, uh, but nine is right out there as being unusual. Um, but since about July 29th, so the last trading day of July, the VIX has actually been uh, trending higher. It's uh, positively diverging, posting a series of higher closing highs and higher closing lows. And this implies that while the volatility, volatility index itself is making new lows, the volatility of the volatility index is actually increasing. And historically, when we look back at this relationship, that divergence between the VVIX and the VIX 
has been an excellent leading indicator of a trend reversal in the VIX itself. So the suggestion here would be because we're seeing a positive divergence in the VVIX versus the VIX, that the VIX has probably hit its low or very near to hitting its low. And we should expect a rather um, abrupt reversal in the trend of the VIX. So we're looking for a VIX spike going forward. And that brings us to chart number five, our last chart in this discussion, and perhaps the most important. And our call is simply this, the counter trend rally is topping. And in our view, there's a very high probability that the S&P 500 is poised to top this week, possibly even today. It may have actually already topped as we're speaking. And one of the reasons that we think that this is probable is that we've now reached a point where we've retraced 50% of the entire decline off the January 4th intraday high. That is a very common counter trend retracement level, and it tends to be formidable resistance. Now, we're slightly through that level today, and uh, it mostly matters where we close as opposed to the intraday range. But, you know, we certainly don't rule out the possibility that we could retrace 61.8% or slightly more. Uh, but, you know, 50% is a pretty good level for what we would describe as a counter trend uh, retracement here. The second is that price is running right into the descending 50 day, 150 day moving average. And also just above that, the 200 day moving average, both are descending. And these have tended to mark counter trend reversals in the past and tend to be pretty significant trend resistance. Finally, price has traced out a classic counter trend pattern, an ABC zigzag pattern, where the A wave is an impulse, an impulse wave, the B wave is counter trend, a, you know, a three wave move, and then the C wave again is a larger impulse wave that now measures 161.8% of wave A, which is a very common relationship. But importantly, we are seeing momentum in the lower panel diverging negatively. And that indicates exhaustion and typically occurs directly before a trend reversal. So our call is simply this. The S&P 500 has been in a counter trend advance since the June 17th low, and it is peaking very likely today, and if not today, within hours of today. Uh, but we would be looking to sell this rally right here, right now, and move to cash before the next leg down ensues. With that, I'd like to wish everybody luck trading. Uh, if you want to follow up with me and take a closer look at my work, you can go to my website, jwhinvestment.com, or find me on Twitter at alpha underscore insights. I'm also on OETV at Alpha Insights and LinkedIn, or just send me an email at jhuge at jwhinvestment.com. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. And again, good luck trading. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.